there is actually pediatric onset Sith person syndrome, which is exceedingly rare. Just to give you an idea, um, over the last 10 years here at Hopkins, we've seen well over 100 patients with Sith person syndrome. Um, and out of the 100 patients plus, there's about six to eight. We're still struggling on a couple patients, whether they truly develop symptoms in their pediatric, but about six to eight patients that we can confidently say they had pediatric onset stiff person syndrome. So you're talking about a one in a million incidents for just stiff person syndrome in general. And out of, you know, a little over a hundred patients here at Hopkins, you know, a fraction of those are pediatric onset. And so we were interested in looking at those individuals as a group and seeing if there's any difference between pediatric onset and adult onset outside of just the age of onset. And interestingly, um, from the preliminary analysis, um, it looks like many of the pediatric onset patients right from the get-go have a number of other coexisting autoimmune disorders. Now we know this in stiff person syndrome if you look at uh, larger case series that have been published in, just in our own experience. There's a high incidence of coexisting other autoimmune conditions like thyroid disease, vitiligo, pernicious anemia. I have a number of patients that have lupus, Sjogren's syndrome plus SPS. Um, but often it seems like those diseases will develop over time and after the stiff person syndrome has been diagnosed. But in the pediatric population, it almost appears, and this is you when know, we're looking at the data in more detail, but it almost seems like some of these diseases start before the stiff person syndrome is diagnosed or shortly after someone gets diagnosed with stiff person syndrome in the pediatric age group that we start finding some of these other uh, coexisting autoimmune disorders. Uh, the patients that I've directly been involved in with pediatric onset step person syndrome, they at some level appear at first glance to have more aggressive disease, uh, meaning that we're escalating therapy quicker and it's not clear why that is from a pathophysiological point of view. Um, also, uh, if we look at uh, these patients, they're if in general they have many more lives to live or many more years to live uh, and so the disability long term for them is uh, potentially much more catastrophic than if you develop it later in in life um, but we're going to really have to tease out the data in more detail to see um, you know is their disease really going to be more devastating long term than our adult uh, population uh, the other thing, too, is um, in stiff person syndrome, I had mentioned the classic cases, right? The axial rigidity, the stiffness in the legs, the spasms, and sort of the lower part of the body. But there's a whole uh, group of uh, patients that are under sort of the umbrella of variant stiff person syndrome, um, where in our pediatric population that we've seen, it seems like they're less in the classic form of stiff person syndrome and they're falling under the variant stiff person syndrome, which is of interest. And why that is immunologically, I'm not sure. Um, maybe there's different uh, epitopes, GAD epitopes that are driving sort of the disease and the spectrum of disease that we're seeing. Um, and maybe in the pediatric population, that's what's happening. But we're gonna have to do further studies to uh, understand that.